Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? We're live on YouTube, on Facebook. Hi, everyone. Okay. Gonna... Let's go. Oh, yeah. We, I'm seeing some comments. Cool. Cool. Good morning, Ken. Oh, Good already? Morning, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. There are people already. It's great. On the ball. All right. Good, hi, good everyone. Evening, I suppose in the West. Yeah. Yeah. In the West. It's um, Thursday evening there. Mm. Hi, everyone. Stay away. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in in our live stream this Thursday evening. How's everyone doing? I'm so happy to see all your smiling faces here. This is Twiggy. I'm a video journalist here at iChongqing. We talk a lot about China topics, conversations around politics, infrastructure, social benefits, and the dynamics between mega cities and countryside. Anything you name it. So all this exciting changes in China during this new challenging era. So if you're interested to know anything about China or curious to see what a powerful country like China is going to impact the world, shape the future, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have many more interesting and exciting comments coming and including live stream vlogs etc so how's everyone doing <laughs> great okay real good right great okay cool so today we are going to address the big elephant in the room something that we or the world have or have to live with for the past two years so today we're going to talk about the current two attitude towards the way we deal with COVID-19 and today we're joined by two amazing guests um, Alex from um, the YouTube channel Alex Absolute and Kai, um, a Canadian writer. Um, mm -hmm. So, without further ado, let's start our conversation today. Um, so, let's give the audience some brief self introduction about our, ourselves. So, maybe let's start with Kai. Oh, hi. Okay, good morning. Um, well, my name is Kai. Uh, I write under the name Jora Kai, a little bit like Angelina Jolie, I guess, but not as attractive. Um, I've been in China, in Chongqing, since 2014. Uh, so that's about eight years now. And unlike most of my teacher friends, I've actually been at the same school for the entire time. Maybe I'm just too paranoid to change visas. I've heard it's quite difficult, and I really don't like paperwork. But they've been a great school for me, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So I've been teaching high school at like an international uh uh, school uh, for eight years. And uh, a couple of years ago, I got the opportunity to kind of uh, sub in as a bit of an editor for some news. And uh, that got me in the loop of kind of getting more in touch with what's going on in China and Chongqing, which was really interesting because a lot of the time, my less than perfect Chinese sort of keeps me just in the classroom and at home and maybe in a taxi to my pizza shop or Ben's bar or something like that. Um, so it was interesting to kind of find out more of what's going on in the rural area and uh, the mega city of Chongqing. And that, of course, led me to this topic today when the outbreak happened uh, in January, end of January 2020. Uh, I was kind of editing some news items about the pandemic. And although I have a couple of uh, cousins and uncles that are doctors, I my medicine skill was not super uh, deep, you know, pathology and uh, viruses and that kind of thing. So I, out of curiosity, I started doing a lot of research into what was going on and uh, how how a coronavirus works and all that. I remember the first day someone said we had a novel virus and we thought, oh, like Harry Potter and really didn't understand, you know, what does a novel <laughs> virus mean? What is all of this stuff? Um, so I started doing a lot of research and a lot of it was very dramatic and kind of panicked. Um, I can be a little bit like that. I think I told some friends I thought it was a zombie apocalypse at the beginning and they didn't appreciate my uh, my flair for the, the horror drama. Um, but as things progressed, I kind of learned a lot more and started writing a diary. And uh, I had uh, Canadian journalists uh, actually ask me to go on CTV News. Yeah, that's a second edition. It's actually coming out. The first one was released in Beijing. I have a copy here too, uh, mm -hmm. in 2020. And this is the Canadian edition. Uh, the, the original one was English and Chinese. This is the English one. It's got lots of pictures and about my life in Canada before the pandemic, uh, life in mostly in Chongqing during the pandemic. And uh, kind of I was approached by CTV News Canada and I Chongqing to syndicate my sort of uh, diary into a column to kind of share the experience. Uh, for me, it was really interesting just to kind of show my life and um in my in my moment of fear i kind of was worried i thought like i'm i'm a writer um but i had many drafts of manuscripts on my shelf and none of them were novels or movies yet that the world could enjoy and i thought oh no this is my like hemingway snows of kilimanjaro moment where i'm looking at my the end of my life and i had so many dreams and they're not going to happen <laughs> hey at least i'll write a diary so my family will know what happened to me 
Uh, but luckily, due to Chongqing's wonderful response, uh, I quickly realized I probably wasn't going to die, at least of COVID this year. And I started to share the good news about masks, <laughs> which started this really complicated relationship with, with the CDC. And I had friends in, in, in public health and, and uh, in, in Toronto and this kind of thing. And they were really pushing back on masks. And uh, I had one person who said, look, Kai, what do you, uh, your, your blog is really nice, charming. You're, you're, you're a nice, cute little writer. You do, you do a nice little column. What was your uh, degree in English and uh, creative writing? Yeah, I have a degree in science. I've been doing public health in Canada for 20 years. Cut it with the mask history area we know they don't work and that was what i was dealing with as the uh, pandemic started so it was quite interesting you know being in this position of uh being a teacher and a writer documenting the uh, pandemic start in china and I actually kept it going once um kind of spread to canada and other countries we had about uh 12 to 15 bloggers around the world uh in different countries you know canada america australia italy um, uk uh, ghana africa uh Buenos Aires, Argentina, just talking about uh, how it kind of started there, how they were dealing with it. And it was quite interesting. Uh, and that was all on my website, theinvisiblewar.co, was my original title for Kai's Diary. But with uh, current you know, tensions, I think, geopolitical tensions with Trump posturing against China and everything, I think everyone decided Kai's Diary was a little bit of a more peaceful uh, title to promote for the book. And it also, you know, it was my diary. So, so that's kind of how it got me to here. And it's been interesting in the last year. Um, I keep writing. I'm working on uh, a new novel now. I wanted to do something that's more kind of positive, uh, not just talking about death and viruses. And uh, I've actually had the opportunity to speak at like the World Forum for China Studies, uh, Human Rights Convention in Chongqing about human rights and COVID-19. And it's been really interesting how just uh, taking the chance to kind of speak out and share my life has gotten me onto different uh, different places to meet a lot of really interesting people. And, and with you here this morning and to meet Alex. It's yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Mm. So my we're going to turn. Yeah, we're going to so we're going to turn to Alex. Can you introduce yourself a little bit to our audience today? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I, pr I probably can't uh, introduce myself quite as well as that. I, I will just... Uh, uh, my name is Alex. I'm, I'm from the UK and I've been here in Wenzhou, China, which is in the south. Uh, we're about 500 kilometers just below Shanghai. I've been here for just a little bit longer than Kai. I've been here since the beginning of 2013. So I guess eight and a half, just over eight and a half years now. Um, I was a teacher for, for many years, and then this year I finally made the jump to just being a full-time, I guess you would say, I would say filmmaker. It sounds cooler than um, <laughs> everybody wants to call themselves a content creator. I, and I, I, I like making videos, basically. I get, uh, that's what I do for a living now. Um, it's, it's, it's what, I, what I intended to do. Uh, I, I'll be honest, I ne never was very fond of teaching, but it was what got me here to China. Um, my China story uh, is, is probably different to everybody else's because I didn't ever plan to come to China. I just had saw an opportunity came up and decided it would be a fun thing to try because you can always go home if you don't like it. And uh, I kind of came here and by, as soon as I came here, I was like, this is cool. I like this. And then I've just kind of stayed. Um, now I've, I've, I've settled right down. I've got, <laughs> got married to a local, had children, bought houses, cars. Uh, so I don't think I'm going anywhere. Um, it's some of the best things you'll ever do in life uh, just by these kind of um, random decisions. Um, yeah. I like to I like to live my life half of it planning and half of it just doing impulsive stuff. Um, I yeah, so I've seen I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen China's changed a lot since I came here in 2013 until now. It has changed so much. <laughs> it's incredible. It's uh, that is uh, developing a. Uh, amazingly fast paced it's, it's been an open. but yeah in a nutshell that is pretty much me okay thank you that's very interesting so um i'm gonna do a self-introduction about myself um so as for me um hi everyone i'm twiggy a video journalist here in i chongqing so for, for the past um three years i've lived in the states uh in new york for my master program study and i have recently come back to china uh, this year in July. So you can see I'm, I'm that person who have experienced a little bit both of the world during the pandemic. So um, I think it's interesting how when the pandemic is, we all are in different places. You guys are in China, but I was in, you know, US. So um, when you are, when I want to first start off by asking Kai and Alex, you know, what was your experience in here in China during pandemic? You know, how about your family? 
what was the situation of the country that they were in? And what are some of the differences that you notice in terms of governor's reaction towards COVID-19? Maybe we can start with Kai. Okay, sure. Um, well, it was it was interesting for sure. Uh, at the beginning, I think anyone in China, whether you're a foreigner, like an expat or, or a local Chinese, uh, we had a very unique kind of introduction because the rest of the world could look and whether they took the knowledge we gained or not, they could say, well, this happened in China. Uh, we had this experience coming out of the, the, the you know, Wuhan lockdown. Wuhan was the, the first publicized lockdown. We don't know, you know the origin of where the virus originated, anything like that has not been established. But as far as we know, Wuhan was this, this big situation that alerted everyone in China. And being in Chongqing, we were just like 850 kilometers away at the beginning of the Spring Festival. So it was like a shock. There was a, I remember reading about a mathematical model out of Hong Kong that predicted that Chongqing would be the next epicenter after Wuhan because we were so close at the beginning of Spring Festival. Yeah. We literally had people driving, like people from Wuhan saying, oh, let's spend Spring Festival in Chongqing. Let's get in our car and drive for eight hours or 10 hours, and we're going to spend a week in Chongqing and this kind of thing. And so it was like frightening at the beginning, and we had no knowledge. Like we had no idea if it was like, like again, like a zombie apocalypse or a bad flu or something in between. And so it was uh, a little bit shocking, and we had the, really the weight to carry. Um, I think people in Wuhan would have had more of that it was an extreme situation but so being in Chongqing was probably pretty mild compared to Canadians I know or anyone in Wuhan but there was still a lot of that like paranoia paranoia and uncertainty um but I was really really uh, enthusiastic about their response you know within about a week or so um you know the Chongqing government had really stepped up they decided to they had you know discouraged travel non-essential travel into Chongqing even to the point of having police officers on the highway kind of saying like hey if you're coming in from you know um coming in from the east if you're headed you know from 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 the Wuhan direction to Chongqing maybe just turn around and go home I know it's spring festival but this is an emergency and so from the beginning we kind of saw um, the desire of people to sacrifice their own wishes, kind of like travel and convenience for the greater good of, um, you know, it's it's smart and safe to settle in, not travel too much, have a lockdown, you know, wear masks to be considerate to other people. And all of that came very quickly. Of course, there was some criticism from the West that Wuhan could have uh, moved a little bit faster. And I know that's been a point of contention. You know, I think they had a big uh, hot pot dinner that was known to be a super spreading event or something like that. But I can mm -hmm. imagine, you know, a big bureaucracy like uh, a super city in China. It's not so easy to just make this kind of decision. People want to see the evidence first. You don't want to let rumors carry you away. You really need a balanced approach. But one thing China did incredibly well, I think, was once we had decided once the people in charge had decided, you know, this is urgent, this is an emergency, they basically said, okay, this spring festival, everyone will stay at home with your immediate family, don't travel too much. And uh, later on, we could talk about, you know, New York Times is still tweeting to criticize China for mm. for, uh, for discouraging international travel during a pandemic. And I recently kind of took some fire on them. I shot, you know, shot some uh, replies to say, I mean, how can you criticize a billion and a half people from not wanting to move around during a pandemic? How many lives did that choice save? So I think, you know, of course, uh, we had a unique experience in China being uh, to learn all about this on the fly. But we learned a lot. We learned really quickly. And uh, being someone that was trying to share this news with my, I had a column on CTV News' uh, homepage for about eight weeks. And um, there was a lot of people that thought it was very interesting, but a lot of people also really came at me and said, you know, uh, why are you telling people to wear masks? That's crazy. We know masks don't work. And now, of course, they've changed their mind and they feel quite embarrassed. But that was, mm -hmm. there was a lot of pushback against the things China was doing for one reason or another. Yeah. So how was your family in, in Canada doing at that time? I think they were doing well. Luckily, everyone in my immediate family uh, listened to me. They took my advice. I had my father and some different people like order uh, masks on Amazon, this kind of thing. So they had these kits I made, you know, said you want hand sanitizer, you want masks, you want to order a couple months worth of food, you know, just be prepared for anything because it could be very chaotic. And we saw in some places, you know, the shelves were empty and even weird things that we never really understood, like the toilet paper craze. Oh, that's the things I don't understand at all. <laughs> yeah, especially in Australia, some countries were totally out of toilet paper. It was it was it was mental. I don't know if they thought like uh, the virus was going to affect them in a different way. <laughs> but, uh, they that's wanted the to most nutritious answer. thing when you're locked down, right? I suppose. Yeah, it's recycled. That was paper, also yeah. a thing in the U.S. as well when I was in you know in New York. Like it was just like the empty shelf, like no toilet paper. Yeah, I know, right? 
Um, so how about uh, Alex? How was your experience in China during this pandemic? I similar but different, I guess. Um, for me, it, it it started off at a slow pace and then kind of picked up because I can I can remember when it started because it was Spring Festival holidays, so we we're all at home. Um, like I remember because we have a, a a nice balcony that looks out across the wetlands and it looks across, into the complex, and I remember that we just had some kind of thing where they'd, um, they'd been going around because there was some kind of dung fever outbreak just down the road. So they'd been around gassing like bushes and stuff. And then that kind of disappeared. Like, and then a week later, I, I remember my wife just saying to me, well, there's this, there's some kind of virus outbreak in Wuhan. And I was like, yeah. I don't really know where Wuhan is. Never heard of it before. Uh, okay, cool. And um, then it was talking about it was kind of talk of it being a little bit serious, not to go mingling in large groups. Uh, so we went to we, we went to a, a meal with uh, friends and stayed at the house. And we go taking, was, I guess it was based like three to four days. It suddenly went from being I think... more concerning, being more serious. Um, because then a lot of people, I remember, they had people in hazmat suits outside here um, with these things, huge mosquitoes, mosquitoes, and they were in gas the whole, um, whole complex. It was kind of um, very post-apocalyptic. Um, and it was just finding out. It was, it was, at first, it was hard to know what was going on. And I guess it was his channels of uh, the first responders, essentially, so they weren't following anybody else's lead. They were just having to be caught on the on the fly, and they responded very well. Like I, I, as soon as everything, uh, as soon as China got onto what was happening, they locked it down pretty fast. We were we had a card, so we were only allowed to go out every other day for like a limited amount of time. Um, we just got to stay at home. Uh, yeah, at home, you had to uh, just. Like, you know, they, they went round and they're like, because Wenzhou here, I don't know if you guys were aware, but Wenzhou was the second worst hit place outside of Wuhan because so many people from Wuhan, uh, that work in Wuhan, live in Wenzhou because I guess from what I gather, Wuhan is more like, um, my wife explained, it's like a hub city. So lots of people come yeah. from around surrounding areas to work there because it's it, it's, it was a place where a lot of um business and stuff was done so there was a lot of people that were working there and um you know, they, they came back to Wenzhou I think it's something like 34,000 came back to Wenzhou from Wuhan and a lot of the people in where the complex where I live so there was a lot of people um there was a lot of stuff where people turned up in the middle of the night in hazmat suits to take away people <laughs> that might have needed um just to be checked um but they had they rolled out everything very fast it was very it was it was really reassuring to see how fast everything was rolled out they had uh systems for checking who was who was where and um, they had the health codes they had the temperature checks rolled out and although it caught everybody kind of off guard china like uh, i thought for me i thought it was quite impressive they they did a great job of um locking it down and then and and getting a, a handle on what things were doing. um it was strange because the rest of the world was just kind of watching and not doing anything because I yeah. I regularly spoke to my parents and because like I, I WeChat called them a lot and they they were saying oh nothing's nothing's happening here yet um, yeah but luckily they they kind of by the time something did start happening in England they'd already got a pretty good grip on what was going on and what precautions needed to be taken because mm -hmm. We'd be. My sister lives here in 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 Shanghai as well. So, okay. for, they 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 got a pretty good like idea of what was going on from us. So yeah, it was it was interesting. It was it was I don't know. It was it was it was well handled. It was as hand, I I think it was handled as well as it could have been. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think at least it's great that your family are well informed by you of like how dangerous mm -hmm. this virus was. Well, I feel like I was in a completely opposite situation than you guys because I was studying in New York while my family is in China, you know, during pandemic. So to have seen all those like serious precautions that China have taken in order to combat this virus, 
I knew how mm -hmm. dangerous this virus was. And there was already, you know, cases in the U.S. I was in New York um, and then in New York as well. As, and But all the schools in New York, because I was studying in Parsons at that time, are still yet to cancel the in-person classes. So we still go to campus. Very few people in New York were wearing masks. You know, at that time I was, and a lot of people in Chinatown was, were. But because the mask in the American culture is something that, you know, for some people who are sick to wear, right? So that's also the reason of why a lot of like hate crimes happen during that time towards Asian people. And I, I, but, but we're just literally just being good citizens of wearing masks, protecting other people's life and ours. And when then, when they finally realized how serious this virus was, and it was just like way too late, you know, for a city like New York, I think a world traveling hub, it should be the first city to have lockdowns when a dangerous virus like COVID 19 appears. Mm -hmm. And the first, you know, COVID 19 uh, case was confirmed on March 1st of 2020. And then, you know, New York quickly just become the epic center of pandemic. And, you know, it must, they were just like a terrible there. Yeah. What? It, I, sorry to interrupt. It must have been terrible there. You know, I was uh, studying quite closely uh, the different cities at the time. And uh, of course, yeah. you know, Wuhan was very bad. Uh, Northern yeah. Italy was very, very bad. And then New York was, uh, was a real tragedy from what I understand. It must have been really, really Yeah, horrible. I used to live on the First Avenue and 36th Street, which is Midtown. And Midtown, then yeah. two, yeah, two blocks away is the New York, I think it's the New York University um, Hospital, which is where they take in most like COVID patients. And you can just literally see all those pictures on the news where they have like, you know, dead body mm -hmm. and just loads of dead body. They don't have enough space to freeze them. Mm -hmm. And it was just like a, such a tragic, you know, scenes to, to watch. And we had that like, in Toronto, up. Canada for a little while too, but not on the scale of New York. No, but New York is such an international city. I think you're absolutely right. They could have taken more precautions. Uh, that was yeah. the one thing, you know, if you want to talk about the difference in approach between Western and Eastern countries, I feel like China, although it may because it's such a large country and, you know, a lot of bureaucracy to manage, you know, from the top kind of thing, uh, took a while to clue in. But once they did, they really spared no expense to put the people's lives first and really take a precautionary principle. So things like masks, the idea that it could be airborne, were all taken yeah. very seriously. Whereas people I was talking to in the West were doing more of a downplaying kind of thing to say, well, you know, I mean, people may have Come from you know, in traveling recently, but until we have you know a thousand confirmed cases, we're not going to really worry about it. Oh, we're not yeah. going to you know they just had this a very the opposite of precautionary, more reactionary maybe. Um, and I think you know the places where it was really really bad, uh, we can see that they just got like swarmed, they got overwhelmed, and uh, precautionary yeah. approach. I think that's them. that's exactly what happened in New York. It's just like I, I think. You know, once they realized how serious it was, you know, and Andrew Cuomo at that time, you know, the the the, the president, of the state of New York governor, State, governor and he, was, York, yeah. he was, yeah, the governor, yeah, that he was doing braving every day, and he was just literally kind of have like a fight with the, with Trump of saying like, where are the masks? Like, we can't get like enough gear for our health profession, and mm -hmm. I, I think it's just like the the system itself in America, it's kind of broken to to combat a virus like this to to face a um, world health issue like this. So it mm -hmm. was just like sad at that time. I, I just feel like a little bit angry and also like a powerless yeah. to change, you know, when the system is already broken and some mm -hmm. people are just like, you know, less poor informed or just ignorant about the situation that was going on at the time. So, yeah, I think it's very sad. Remember, sure, you know. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> My, my policies is awful because I have almost zero interest in it, but I think if I remember correctly, there was policies or there was at least the idea discussed of be, having a pandemic response. I can't remember if it's in the year, but, my memory is from that. but um, and like a year or two before the pandemic actually happened, people were like, now we didn't need that, but the funds, um, it's just terribly bad timing, I guess nobody's actual fault, but in hindsight, if they just... Um, Put that money there, it would have been there would have been a lot better response. Um, sure. that's it. <laughs> okay, so it's okay. I think Alex, your, your audio is like being cut a little bit, but that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, it's yeah, breaking up I a little think, bit. I think it's breaking up a little bit, but <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, oh, 
came back okay. to politics. Okay. One thing I want to mention, maybe we had a bit of a segue from the tragedy of New York. It's not exactly appropriate to follow up the New York tragedy with this, but I recently got a memory on my Facebook someone had shared, and I thought it was just so interesting to kind of look at these, the people's responses to masks. I'm sorry, this is just on my phone. Can you see this, uh, this dinosaur? Let me bring you uh, around here. Yeah. Here, uh, this kind of approach people had. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's, uh, there you go. Very bizarre masks options, you know, from yeah. shower curtains to grapefruits. And uh, maybe I'll send it to you on the, the stream yard or something. We can try it out. It was just like people had the most absurd responses to masking because there wasn't a culture in place. I think that's one thing China had that was really beneficial. China, I think Japan as well, maybe South Korea. Like when people get a bad cold, they wear a mask so other people around them don't get sick. And that's just like a basic courtesy. And in, yeah. I know in my country of Canada, it's not so not so popular or common so when people started saying you know maybe you should wear a mask they were wearing like superhero masks or just making their own bizarre you know dinosaur horse face kind of thing and it, the pictures coming out at the time were like absurd it was like this gallows humor like dark humor where people thought you know there might be a pandemic maybe we'll die i'm gonna put on a horse helmet and go buy some uh, vegetables or something it was totally absurd like it was a very strange time and of course, yeah. the, the 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 idea that the West was saying don't wear masks and then change their mind and said wear masks, I, I still never really understand the flip flopping because I feel like it really, it didn't help the people that were already distrustful of the experts. Like I think that was another advantage in China is that people generally listen to doctors and science and people generally follow the government advice. And um, of course, in a pandemic, like having everyone listen to the experts was the best thing we could have done. Uh, and in places where people wanted to exercise the right to protest the restrictions, um, I'm sure those were super spreader events in their own. If you had 10,000 people in the street screaming, we don't want to wear masks, I'm breathing all over you. I mean, that's not going to help, right? <laughs> that's just the protest I, I was saying like every day in New York, to be honest with you. Uh, I think that, yeah, you had a point that w there is definitely a divide towards certain topic in this world, just like for our experience of living different, you know, countries during pandemic. I, there's, there's, also a two attitude towards COVID-19. You know, you know, there's the China's approach was also known as the zero tolerance policy. Um, I think there's some misunderstanding about uh, Chinese zero tolerance policy. I think to some people, it might sound like, oh, one case in China just like froze, uh, like the whole society and, and economy just stopped. But no, that's not the case. We control the spread and infection rates of the virus by, you know, massive testing, uh, target lockdowns and put certain area under travel restriction. You know, that's what we uh, mean by zero tolerance policy. Now, I think we can all share our experience in daily life here in China under zero tolerance policy. You know, how has it impact your life? Does it impact your life at all? And what was your opinion and take on, on China's zero tolerance policy towards COVID-19? And maybe let's start with Alex. Okay, yeah. Um, is the audio back? Is, it, is everything okay now? Yeah, your audio is still breaking, breaking up a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, after this section, I'll uh, I'll try and uh, maybe turn off my VPN. But um, let me know if you can if you if you if anything goes wrong. Um, how about how about let's this do this? How about let's do this? Let's let Kai answer this question first, and you can uh, log in and log out again, and okay. decide if your audio is better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All so, right, let's... so tw Twiggy, your question was about uh, daily life, like uh, daily life yeah, during the lockdowns? Yeah, dur during the zero tolerance policy, actually. Sure. And what was your, you know, does it impact your life at all? And what was your opinion take on, on the zero tolerance policy? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, we took it very seriously. Even amongst my friends, I had friends, uh, my friend Andrea liked to take buses sometimes and do things that I thought like, you're in a bus, like you're in a bus during the pandemic. Like uh, we, we literally didn't even uh, leave our house for the most part. We would go to like, we had a little balcony. We could look down on the street and get fresh air, but we really took it quite seriously. I even got to the point of, I was wearing like two masks and go swim goggles to go to the grocery store. And we mostly ordered oh. 
we wow. were very serious. Well, I mean, there was an article at one point that came out that said that the um, SARS-CoV-2 was a hundred times more infectious through the ocular membranes, through the eyes, than the original SARS. And yeah, that was a is. point of news, I think, in the West that got totally lost because I think they had such a hard time just getting basic mask compliance that they thought we're not going to get people to wear goggles too, right? But I, w I went full in. I had gas masks. I had swim goggles. I had uh, you know, various masks. Originally, um, because I, I when I was younger, I was actually in music and I used to play at like festivals like Burning Man and stuff. And there you could have a dust storm every few minutes, just like in Mongolia kind of thing. So you needed to have respirators, masks and goggles just for basic protection. So when it happened, I was actually lucky that I kind of just looked over to my shelf and said, OK, Shalyn, here's a couple. My wife, here's a couple. Here's a pair of the goggles and a couple of respirators and we're good to go. Uh, it's always helpful to be um, to be prepared. But yeah, we took it very, very seriously for 60 or 70 days. And then in around uh, April, maybe April 2020, um, I, still went, I went back to school. I had been doing online classes for a couple of weeks, starting in maybe mid-March or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I think the very strong uh, restrictions were really comforting. Like at first it was a big shock, but to have the government say, this is a big problem. We're going to take it very seriously. Uh, Non-essential people should stay off the streets. We just need to, because they were really scientific. Like I had graphs, even if you look at them, um, I'll try to find the page at the back of my book here. Um, they did a, a, you know, simple and informative things about, let's see here, if I can find this, this one, the power of social distancing, this blue one, is that clear here? Uh, no. I'm mm. sorry. sorry. It's backwards. That's fine. backwards. Yeah. The one about the people multiplying, the essential idea, the takeaway of that is that, you know, the, the if you can reduce the amount of people in the streets just talking by 50 percent, it's an exponential reduction on spread. So it was just yeah. a clear message from the government. You know, if you don't have to work outside, work from home. If it's not safe to go to school, take online classes. If you can have one person in the house going to do groceries, it's safer than three. And that simple idea of just trying to use like little fractions and exponential reduction in contact to limit uh, the possibility of spread. You know, when you couple that with like the incredible technology of China, we had these apps, the codes, the health code, uh, vaccination codes when that came out. Uh, we have this incredible network of CCTV. In my book at one point, there was this really funny story about a guy that had a 14 day quarantine at home and he went Went out at about the day 12 or 13 and said you know i just want to stretch my leg and go to the park or something and cctv like somehow i don't know how exactly how it worked but somehow they figured out he was supposed to be home still and they called his boss and his boss called him and said we're about to get fined a bunch of money in the company you got to go home you got like 20 minutes before we have to pay a fine and he went oh my he's looking up oh my god how? you know and in, some, so in the west maybe they would say that's uh, an invasion of privacy or it's scary to me it felt very very comforting you know, if you're not a criminal, I think the fact that the streets are very safe in China, that's a good thing. I don't personally go around pickpocketing people, so I'm happy to know the streets are safe. You know, uh, so I think in this case, our incredible technology, CCTV, that whatever AI helps to maintain that, uh, all of this technology and the codes. China is just forward thinking. We embraced all the technology. And so, every, you know, there was like a, like a teacher from Harvard who got kicked out for, for not wanting to show her, her her code or something. And everyone just thought that was incredibly foolish. Like, it uh, doesn't matter if you're from Harvard or some big school. Everyone has to work together to do a good yeah. job. And so it's a, it's a funny dynamic. You know, the societies are different. I think in the normal times, people can have a healthy distrust of science, I guess, if they're not a scientist, that can be their opinion, they, whether masks work or not. But the fact that China uh, generally works well together was an incredible advantage during the pandemic and places where there was a lot more of this negotiation and discussion during a normal time about normal policy. Maybe it's OK to have that. But during a pandemic, I think we saw that you really need to work well together. And so, you know, of course, in China, we did a great job. We all sacrificed when it was safe. We all went outside. The alternative was like in places like Ottawa, Canada, where my father is, or Toronto. Uh, we had Premier Ford, who kind of had this sort of was being joked about like a light switch rave policy. Mm -hmm. Everyone go home. Two weeks later, it's starting to get better. Okay, everyone can go out again. Two weeks later, it's starting to get worse. Okay, everyone go home. And in the long run, the on and off <laughs> is much more damaging for the economy, for mental health, for everything. Yeah. And, and everyone is, and they have no confidence in the leadership. It's very uncertain. Whereas again, I think uh, there was a, I'll, I'll finish with this point. There was like a study that showed in times of stress, like, and even with a gambling, if you're going to lose money, you'd rather lose a little more money once then lose half your money over and over and over again. And people yeah. deal people deal better with a 50-day lockdown and then relative freedom as opposed to two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, two weeks off for years, which is what we saw, sadly, in a lot of the Western world. 
Yeah, I think it's exactly this back and forward <coughs> policy definitely costs more than just you know one time lockdown and we're we're down for this. And so so how Alex, so what do you think the your um I think your voice your audio is getting better. So what should be your, okay now. Uh, yeah, yeah, what was your experience in daily life here in China under the zero uh, tolerance policy and how has that impact your life? Does it impact your life at all? And what was uh, your opinion and take on on this like zero tolerance policy? So I I can I can maybe spark a little bit of controversy for me because the zero tolerance and the, the lockdown was probably like I en I enjoyed my time uh, because I I I don't I wasn't very happy with being a teacher at that time I didn't really like it um, I I wasn't working for a very good school um, and I was pretty lucky I uh, like I know a lot of people were not lucky but for me I was pretty lucky because the school said we'll just keep full pay you don't have to come in you just have to work and teach online for I think it's like two hours a week um, just just be prepared to help out and I was like I'm all good with that so I, I for me I got to spend a lot of time with my family um, I don't really need to go out like um, I, as long as I got my family here, I've got a connection to the internet. Uh, I did a lot of live streaming, a lot of video making, uh, and really started pushing myself in a direction that I wanted to go. So I used it. Um, I kind of used, uh, turned a negative into a positive by uh, using it as an opportunity to forward myself, to study, to, to push my life uh, to where I wanted it to be. Um, and the zero tolerance policy worked well. Like it, you could see the results. Like for me, um, I I say this to everybody, but for looking at Facebook and looking at back home in England and seeing the news with America and a lot of these other countries, it seems like since the pandemic started, it's never stopped there. Whereas for me, mm -hmm. by the time May came around and we went back to work. Apart from like things like wearing masks in public, like large gatherings or a lot of large gatherings being generally cancelled, uh, masks and taxis, a DD, like if you call a DD, the Chinese Uber, you had to wear a mask. Apart from things like this and like showing a health code, uh, life was pretty much back to normal. So for me, the actual pandemic part of it didn't last more than three or four months. Um, and that was great because, like, like uh, Kai was just saying, it would just be a, such a pain if if you had to two years of just it constantly happening and constantly happening. Like mm -hmm. now we have we have like occasionally they'll be like oh there's a flare up and it'll be like one case they found somewhere. They step on it pretty fast. Like um, recently at Shanghai Disneyland, everything was dealt with super fast and there was it was no big deal. It didn't really even affect anybody else's life and that's I think that's because of the zero tolerance policy. Yeah, but yeah, actually, I had a friend in that was in uh, Shanghai Disney that day. They they got locked down. Shout out to Tracy if you're if you're listening online. She's a, <laughs> a student in Shanghai. We met at the uh, at the World Forum for China Studies when I was there meeting other people. And uh, yeah, so I got the inside scoop on that. And they did just locked it down, tested everybody. She had to go home for a week or two, and then mm -hmm. uh, everything was everything was good. Like the, the way they really do stomp on it, and it's great. Yeah, yeah. Although um, I I would say that I would like the zero tolerance policy to have worked and us to get back to normal soon because I do kind of um, I do kind of miss going back to see my parents. I haven't seen my parents in person for two years. I mean you can video call them all you like, but it's not the same as actually seeing them. I'd like it I'd like um, I would like life to go back to normal relatively quickly. I think we're I think we're done with it now. We've 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 had the pandemic. Let's just uh I, th Next I think there's thing, some, good, some right? good songs, though, good news, you know. Uh, we don't know exactly yet, but a couple of things. What was it yesterday? I got a notification on my WeChat that China has uh -huh. a, uh, granted emergency approval for the first COVID drug. I, I, I should really just... Uh, I guess we'll have to check that out for yourself. They're monoclonal antibodies that attack uh, the SARS-CoV-2 ability to to reproduce, basically. So that's really, really good. There's a few countries in, in the West. They have a Pfizer one and a Merck one, and China's got its own emergency approval. So I think yeah. when we get uh, to a situation where we can really fight the ability of it to become widespread outbreaks, and it gets to this individual situation where like one person is very sick with this virus, and they could go to the doctor and get help, um, then I I think uh, I know in China we have a very famous doctor, Zhong Nan Chan, who's been speaking about uh, sort of the government and science based willingness. Like, what will it take to open up tourism again responsibly? And I think they yeah. mentioned what was the statistic when the fatality is like point 
zero one percent or yeah. point mm -hmm. point one percent like one in a thousand people who get sick will die that might be an acceptable uh number a morally you know acceptable number as opposed to again i mentioned the the, the new york times who was recently criticizing china for the lost uh global economic tourism revenue yeah. just kind of i was just about to mention that yeah, it's just kind of funny because the implicit, that's what I kind of attacked them for. Because again, as a writer, and I want to I want to say that I also, I feel very lucky, like Alex, to be able to, I have really enjoyed, I, you know, I made this wish. I hope I didn't cause the whole thing right before that spring festival. I said, you know, this winter break, I really hope I can write a book. I hope I can rest my voice from the, my, my perpetual teacher voice from lecturing all the time. I hope I can take a long time to spend with my family. And then this happened and I thought, oh no, is this my fault that I do this? Because here I am, I had this moment of a mortal fear, I'm going to die. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write my diary. And actually I got, you know, I got a book deal. I got it published, which was a nonfiction sort of para, para, paranoid, paranormal virology thriller, kind of a nonfiction dystopian science fiction book. It was quite, quite interesting how it turned out. And then I've got this Amos the Amazing coming out, like a magic fantasy. And so it's really uh, shown me, like in the, in the face of my own mortality at 40 years old, I thought I better, if I want to be a writer, I better write, I better write five ten books and get them done because i'm not going to live forever none of us will and the time at home was very good um, it was a different thing i had a friend who was a um a worker at an ngo in ghana africa who hooked me up with an author an author named david uh Alecker, who was my blogger in app to show the the ghana perspective of the of the pandemic but my friend stephanie um she got covid two or three times helping you know encampments of refugees she would have like jeeps and be transferring people and and you know they have like wow. developing country poverty Poverty situations that are very difficult in normal times and all of a sudden when the government wants to lock people down there were countries and places where people were saying like okay so if we don't lock down people will die and if we lock down people will starve to death because they're making daily food wages and they can't afford to stay home for three weeks they don't have groceries for three weeks and my heart goes out to people that had to make those kind of decisions both in the policy and the individual home because that that is a real tragedy and those are really hard decisions to make I think all all of us that were in countries, whether it's China or the UK or Canada, were more or less, we either had some savings or the government, like in Canada, we had the CERB, the CURB or CERB fund. I think every Canadian got $2,000 basically to stay home and just to keep life progressing and be responsible and and not spread the pandemic and for a lot of people that did mean they could you know paint pictures or reevaluate their life or write a book on poetry or just kind of like think about what they want to do. And it was an incredible uh, opportunity to kind of evaluate things, I think, uh, as an environmentalist. And I've got a, a nonfiction book I'm working on next called uh, Solar Punk, An Optimist's Guide to the Apocalypse is the, the rough wow. title. I tried, <laughs> I tried out my material at the World Forum on China Studies. They asked me uh -huh. to speak about in Shanghai. This was in October, just before the Disneyland thing. I managed to find a nice window uh, between Nanjing, small flare up and the recent Shanghai one. There was a little window where it was safe to go from Chongqing to Shanghai. And, and I'm glad that mostly things are, you know, we have these little flare but but yeah um the idea that you know we have an incredible challenge ahead of us with environmental issues and mm -hmm. most people just try to get through the day and don't have a lot of energy to look about that to think about it really but i think the pandemic gave a lot of people pause for reflection to think about their own lives and to think about these really big existential issues like the environment and it was actually one more thing like if we have time for a quick anecdote um in all the yeah. bizarreness of kind of reshaping my life as a lot of us you know uh, alex you, you transferred to be a, a, a content creator a filmmaker, right? Um, I jump started my, my book career. I met a friend named Ryan, uh, who was uh, he, he became a, a, a filmmaker for uh, National Geographic. You know, a lot of people wow. have visited me. <laughs> That's yeah, what I'd like, like to be. World Forum in China Studies. Yeah, yeah, well, check it out. I'll link you guys up later if you want. He's a really interesting guy. <laughs> yeah, for uh, sure. Ryan Milton in, in Beijing now, uh, originally from Changsha. Shout out to Ryan if you're here or checking us out later. Uh, wonderful guy. We're both DD nerds. We bonded right away. But uh, just like an incredible opportunity to reshape your life and to to do things. I actually met Jean-Claude Van Damme, a childhood hero of mine. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He was yeah. Speaker. Same. Hey, I, what the heck? You know, like, I'm an English teacher in China. And all of a sudden, I, I got asked to do a COVID recovery and rebuilding conference, a digital conference in Canada about how to recover. And I thought, well, great. After months of people telling me to stop with the mask hysteria, someone wants to hear my advice. And my advice was basically, what do the smart doctors in China know? And how can I share that with my friends and family? family so that uh, I'm sorry I got this hat here I've just been out all morning um, how can the rest of the world take China's lead and recover and one of the guests was Jean-Claude Van Damme and his whole thing was he was talking about how um, there are dolphins
happens in the canals in Venice again. Uh, the you know birds in places like the, the nature and wildlife was making a recovery as the humans stayed in their homes. And he thought there was like a beautiful yeah. yin yang karmic balance of that. And he thought you know take this moment to do the Jean Claude Van Damme perfect splits and just try to relax and take a breath. And maybe that's what we need to to think about solar power recovery and how we can you know change. Uh, the environment to be a more sustainable planet like those are huge issues but i think having the time to really think about it was incredible yeah that's great so i i think back to the point that you were talking about how people have this like you know privilege of staying at home and how the other people have to you know literally work to stay alive and to you know not starve themselves i think that was why i was a little bit angry at that time, you know, back in the U.S., because people have all those privilege of staying at home and, you know, not going out and not to, you know, spread the virus, but they still choose their freedom over other people's lives. So that was, you know, I was just like a little bit angry about that. And so back to the um, the zero tolerance policy, I think we can all agree that it might, you know, disrupt some several, you know, local economy. But our goal is to keep the society running as a whole so we don't lose more life because the current, you know, 2% of death rate of this uh, disease globally, despite the vaccination, is just simply not acceptable um, in China. So I would like to ask um, another question that is like, what do you think are some of the things that other country can probably learn from China's zero tolerance policy? Maybe let's start with Alex about this question. Um, I, th I think they, they, they should, uh, like a good takeaway would be that if you act quickly and you act in a not strict, but in a in a very definite manner, then you will do better than if you flip flop between different ideas. Uh, also, communication and listening to people, and leaving politics out of situations, because a lot of this has been just piggybacked by people with hidden political agendas and people mm -hmm. making everything politicized that's not politicized um, instead of just listening to other people and learning from other people. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, I've seen so many stuff with people that just blindly follow said news outlet. They said this and this is what it's like. Um, yeah. And just, to, just to, for people to be aware and, and to make up their own minds, not just be, oh, Facebook said it. So it's got to be right, hasn't it? Like some guy on Facebook said it. Oh, that's that's exactly how it is. Just to, like to, to people should learn to think for themselves um, and yeah. follow, follow, follow advice from people that are credible and not be like, nah, I, I know better than those people. I think that's the, the main takeaway because there's been a lot, a lot of people that um, it's some of the wacky stuff you see on Facebook and on the internet. It's it's just kind of I've lost my faith in in humanity at some point. So I was like, how can people be that stupid? Like honestly. Yeah, and I think you had a point that never led these things into a political fight. I think you were facing some issue when you're trying to send some mass to the U.S., right? Is that yeah, we 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 tried um, we tried to to send a lot of masks. Um, it's not it wasn't entirely for for like some humanitarian reason before anybody says oh alex you're such a like, like such a nice guy there were people that were asking could you could you send these masks and we're, we're looking for this many masks can you arrange it and like i can i i could have um we we could have stood to have made quite a bit of money because there's a lot of factories here that um i know my wife's friends own that were ready to supply masks but they were being hindered um and only to the us there as soon as you said D could you ship them, ship them to europe they said sure no problem we have all the relevant um health and safety i've forgotten what it's called now the, the health and safety certificates that you have to have but as soon as you said to america they just said no like um trump's policies have made it too hard and we can still supply them, but you guys would have to sort out all of the um, all of that shipping yourself. And I'm not a shipping expert; it's not my job. <laughs> I've, 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 I, it's completely not in my wheelhouse, so it, it never really happened. And that was because it just blew my mind that there was these policies that were brought about. And I guess it's like once again, it's politics between the two countries. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like it was politics between the two countries. And you'd have thought, in a time of need, you'd relax that. To get the supplies which you needed to the people that need it but no so it basically fell flat on its face there was no point trying to trying to go ahead and try and send them um just yeah 
politics ruined uh, something which could have been, which yeah. could have sent a lot of masks to people, essentially. Yeah, I think the politics can also uh, relate to the, the, the retweet that uh, Kai did responding to New York Times that, you know, this, they were showing global tourism suffering from China's zero tolerance policy. And your response to that was quite interesting. And I, it seems like uh, the, this media this day are really just like picking up like political fights. I was wondering what's your uh, take on that and what do you think are some of the things that countries can learn from China's zero uh, tolerance policy? Sure. Well, again, I always feel very torn if I'm picking on or uh, being very critical of the New York Times because I hope one day that they put me on their bestseller list for one of my books. <laughs> you know, as, as a writer, it's a very prestigious kind of thing. Oh, New right. York Times bestseller. Um, how I, I don't know if they ever will, if they ever read my tweets about me uh, criticizing their their critique <laughs> of China. I hope that they can be more <laughs> political about that because my interest is health and not politically oriented. So of course, you know, I'm uh, I do respect the journalists and writers that the New York Times celebrates and some of the I'm sure some of the writers are quite uh, quite talented journalists and that kind of thing but it does seem like um, you know the West is very quick to criticize China as Trump when he was in power was very quick to blame Mexico or China for any problem with his economy it always seems very convenient and easy to point the blame at someone else as a way you know I mean I guess that it could even happen in my own home you know if my wife came in and said did you make this mess and I might have said it's I think it's the dog I think the dog must have done it <laughs> and that's when it gets the heat off me and Ben Ben's in the bathroom for an hour cooling off and I go oof that worked good for that Shannon's not listening um, I have two scapegoats I mean children the very, the very natural response is to, to try to not to take responsibility and blame someone else. Uh, but as a leader, we sort of should hold people to a higher standard. And I think leaders and journalists should try to, to be as helpful as possible, just like first responders. They have this higher duty during a pandemic. And, you know, I think the, some of the reluctance to take the Asian, someone in the comments had pointed out a Malaysian doctor was quick to support masks. I know in Japan and South Korea as well, they were very quick on the uptake. I think it was an Asian thing in general to be very quick on masks. And what was the reason yeah. the West was so re reluctant? They didn't want to learn a lesson from China because they think, oh, we're smarter than Chinese doctors, we're American doctors. I don't know. I mean, that seems very petty and silly, but to think of the amount of lives that were lost is a real tragedy. I remember reading a study when it was only about 300,000 American deaths from COVID. Now it's over 750,000. And the study at the time said that 98%, the vast overwhelming majority of those deaths would have been preventable if the South Korean model, but not even the Chinese model, because maybe they didn't want to say Chinese model for political reasons. But they said South Korea, if what South Korea had done for the lockdown had been used instead of Trump's sort of everyone run around and cough on each other model, they would have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, which is a very, I mean, that's a huge, it's a huge deal. If every country had, had just followed China's lead and, and we had all worked together as productively as possible, I probably, Alex and I would have been able to go home and see our family a year ago. People would be back to normal. And there's all these uh, unintended consequences where mental health is at stake. People are losing their businesses. People, you know, I sympathize with people that say, I don't want to close my restaurant. That's my family's business for 50 years. It's my livelihood. And now they're the ones protesting the lockdown. But the irony is the lockdowns are extending the pandemic. And so you have this vicious cycle in science, you call it a positive cycle, even if it's negative, just that, you know, people breathing on each other, people resisting, people perpetuate the thing. I mean, I get it's very complicated, but... Uh, uh, the, the saddest thing for me, I think, and maybe to leave on this note, is that it, I think it disproportionately affects uh, the poor and the working class. People that have a good, uh, you know, good job were able to work from home, whereas the heroes were the Meituan delivery people here or the, the pizza delivery people in America or something. People that had to go to work in dangerous situations were the most likely ones to die. People that couldn't afford healthy food and might have a, a weight issue or had a, had a comorbidity that was predisposed. Often it's the working class that likes to smoke more, which is another um, uh, more comorbidity for COVID. And I think that the, the pandemic shed a real light on the problems and challenges of society, whether they're environmental, economic, class issues. And in a way, that's a gift to be able to see the issues we need to help to improve to make a more equitable society. But mm -hmm. it was definitely the people at the bottom that hit the hardest, and we should really support them. Uh, yeah. I think we need to vaccinate. Until we vaccinate the whole world, we're going to have more mutations possibly that could be very dangerous. You know, we need to really work together, and that would be what what we really end this. I think yeah. that's going to be pretty hard. 
Yeah, I think we would all <laughs> agree <a> that, <laughs> you know, in order to stop the, you know, control the pandemic, you, we need to put politics aside and, you know, move forward. We need the whole world to like work together and we need to increase the vaccination rate, improve um, rapid testing ability to scale. We need to also have more restrict control on the borders of all countries. And most importantly, we need to protect and help the country that are in need and most vulnerable um, while combating the virus. Uh, for example, the developing, country, the developing country, the African country, and some South um, East Asian country. So I've recently read the news that China has donated over 1.8 billion doses of vaccine in total and is projected to provide 2, bi 2 billion doses of vaccine in the near future. So, And also China is prioritizing developing countries in vaccine donation. I would like to know uh, what are your opinion on this and how do you think that is going to impact the results of our, our battle uh, with COVID-19? Let's start with Alex. I, I I think it's great. Don't, uh, you 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 can you can never say a bad thing about donating stuff which is going to help people. Uh, whether or not people are going to uh, not whether or not everybody is going to take it because um, it, there's a lot of people that you know they got the tin foil hats out and they're like it's the government it's the government they're trying to track us they're trying to do this um, uh, which is hilarious in itself because uh, all these people which think that there is um, the, uh, these conspiracy theories behind vaccines actually post more information than they than they they're worried about being given to themselves on facebook voluntarily like every day it's it's almost hilarious uh, it's 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 fantastic it's uh, <laughs> but i think but like vaccines like i said like if you if you're donating them to the people that really need them then you know, what is there to say apart from that's fantastic there there is no discussion for uh, no discussion really needed it's it's fantastic if you ha if you have the ability to help somebody that's less fortunate than yourself that makes that, that's a very good thing to be able to do um i think the masks thing might be a little bit more difficult as well because but not not just because of people that are a bit tinfoil hat conspiracy but um because of culture like, for example, in China, I think China adopted the whole wearing a mask a lot more e a lot easier because mm -hmm. it's always been culture here. Before the virus even came, people would always, oh, I've got a cold, I'm wearing this mask. And it wasn't, um, people never saw it any differently. Whereas in England, the joke was always, before the pandemic, if you were wearing a mask, you could have got shot by the police. But if now, now, you can get shot by the police for not having a mask. Um, it's 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 always been the stigma in a lot of Western countries that if you're wearing a mask or you're covering your face, it's for an untoward um, purpose. There, there's a reason. Like if you go into a shop in England before the pandemic and you're covering your face up or you're wearing a hoodie with the hood up, uh, people would instantly be like, "This guy's up to no good." So I think there's a, a stigma attached to masks in the West, which also doesn't help apart from the tinfoil hat theories. I think it's, I think there's something which people need to, um, it's, it's hard to, for people to get used to that, I think. Yeah, that's great insight. How about you, Kai? Kai? Oh, so much to dig into there. I will pick one or two things. Um, I think, I guess, <laughs> bring it back to the vaccines to start before we get carried away on another uh, interesting tangent, wild tangents that were very fascinating to, uh, I wish we had, you know, all day to talk about this. Um, I think in terms of China donating billions of vaccines, I mean, again, like Alex said, uh, you can't think, no one could say that's a bad thing. I've actually seen some, uh, maybe New York Times, BBC actually criticized China in the sense of saying like, uh, oh, you're just trying to suck up to other countries to be popular. That's why you're saving all those lives, which I think it's preposterous. But if you're going to have a global arms race between China and the West, I would rather it be how many billions of vaccines can we give to developing countries rather than mm -hmm. how can we build weapons or, or, or things that will hurt and kill people. So, I mean, great. Yeah. If that's the race they want to have to see who's the superior country, perfect. Give everybody vaccines. Uh, everyone, you know, China gave a lot of them. America gave a lot of them. UK gave a lot of them. And oh, that's great. You know, that I think that's a good uh, race to have as a positive outcome. Um, yeah. I think it can really help a lot of countries and it's very beneficial. You know, we're still getting the news uh, in many countries. There's the the threats and the unknown of the new variants, including Omicron, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. We didn't have a chance to talk about that one yet. But actually, there's some good uh, anecdotal science from South Africa and Botswana, I believe, where a lot of the studies have, uh, you know, their the initial uh, information is coming from to say that it's actually possibly very mild. And that actually might be really, really good news. I know in mm -hmm. China, 
no one's going to want to hear we should all get Omicron to end the pandemic because it's antithetical to the zero uh, cases we've had. But in, in, in South Africa, it seems to be, I believe, uh, as of a week or so ago, the studies I was reading, I've been doing a new blog and working on that, was that uh, I think in two to three weeks, it went from 0% to 90% of the cases in Botswana. So it's incredibly mm -hmm. infectious, which is a concern because Delta was already much more infectious than the Alpha and Beta. So if mm -hmm. it can in two weeks dominate the Delta, that means it's incredibly contagious. But that being said, there was a very, very low rate of serious incidents. So if you had a mutation that ended up being incredibly infectious, became the dominant one, and almost nobody died, that works out great. And then you add to that uh, vaccination rates, which keep people safe, and um, some of these new medicines from Pfizer, Merck, or the, the Chinese one that will help to, to fight it and reduce its ability to spread and infect. Um, you know, maybe we can go see our family and travel again and get back to life next year. That would be ideal. Yeah, that's perfect. That's a, that's a wonderful conversation that we're having today. And thanks mm. for everyone joining our live stream. Currently, I see 44 people joining our live stream. And so we're going to wrap that uh, conversation today. And thank uh, thanks to Alex and Kai joining our um, live stream and give wonderful conversations. And also, please follow Alex from the YouTube channel, Alex Absolute. And also, if you get a chance to read this interesting book from Kai, and it's about his... Uh, diaries in, in, in quarantines in China. And please make sure that you follow us um, on YouTube channels and, and on mm -hmm. Facebook and all those platforms to follow more things about China and also lo 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 local news here in Chongqing. Where can we yeah, get the book in, if we're in China? Uh, in China, uh, whatever you like to shop with, you can check out uh, the, the uh, JD or uh, Taobao apps, uh, Pindodo if you're looking for discounts. They all, they all have it. Just put in... Oh. Uh, Kai's, Kai's diary. Okay. This is the Canadian edition about to come out, but they have this version, English and Chinese, and they have there's an ebook available on Amazon. And if anyone wants to follow me, it's at Jorakai, J O R A H K A I, on Twitter. And I have a blog I've been doing, well, my regular blog, Jorakai.com. And then since the pandemic started, the invisible war.co. And I have many stories of different people around the world uh, talking about it uh, in the past. And uh, if anyone wants to do a blog for me from your part of the world, how you're still coping with it, I'd be happy to hear from you and uh, I'll host your blog. Nice. That's great. Make sure, make sure you get Kai's book. <laughs> so thanks to everyone who joined our live stream today. And to, uh, the next, uh, the topic of next week is going to be Chinese infrastructure. That's also going to be something that you might be, that you want might to tune in and listen to. So that's it, guys. Okay, great. Stay safe out there, everybody. One thing, if I can mention one last thing, vitamin D, sure. get your sunshine, get your vitamin D. That was actually the one thing that I wish was talked about more. And uh, again, sorry to throw that in the last moment, but there's so many studies that show if you have a healthy, you don't want to just drown in orange juice and whatever, but if you have a healthy level <laughs> of vitamin D, it's really, really good for the body. And it's a lot harder to get sick, even if you catch COVID. So stay healthy, everybody. Wear your masks. Yes, yeah, stay healthy. Vitamin D, get some sunshine. Be well. We'll nice see, see you next guys. week. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.